Now we really start with a presentation from two colleagues before we go into a discussion and a panel round, because I think um, if you haven't heard about it, FIFPO did an excellent survey um, with players worldwide, and I think the findings and results are really interesting and worthwhile listening to. So I would like to ask Aristea Kokiadaki and Andrew Orsati from FIFPO on stage for their presentation. Thank you very much. You can come this way if you like. Uh, thank you, everybody, and for this opportunity to present some of our preliminary findings from what is the first ever global survey of working conditions for female players. These are elite players, players who uh, represent their countries and players who are uh, at the highest level that they can reach at their clubs in a particular country, the countries that qualified for this report. I'm Andrew Orsati, as you heard, I'm FIFPRO's Director of Communications. FIFPRO is the World Players Union. We're present in over 60 countries and estimated 65,000 professional footballers are under our care through the player associations in each country. We are the international umbrella organization representing their interests on policy and so on, on the regulations of the international game to stakeholders like FIFA and also on a regional level, UEFA and others. This is Aristea Kukiadaki, a senior lecturer from Manchester University who assisted us with this survey. And it's an important moment for FIFPRO as an organization because uh, it's the first time we do this and it helps us frame policy and help us identify where we need to focus our attention around the professionalization of women's football. I would first like to just give you some quick background. Caroline Jonsson, you see on your screen there at the top, she is a former goalkeeper of Sweden, and she is the head of uh, FIFPRO's Women's Football Committee. She oversaw much of the development of the questionnaire and bringing in the expertise of uh, many players, past and present, for various working sessions. Uh, you see some of them there on screen. Nadine Angara, former winner of the FIFA Player of the Year Award, and also Kirsten van der Ven, recently retired from the Dutch national team. We then approached Aristea here and Jeff Pearson from the University of Manchester to refine the survey, and it contained 40 questions. You see some of the issues we covered on the right there, education, contracts, salaries, benefits, adequacy of pay, child support, discrimination and harassment in the workplace, match fixing, the level of coverage from agents, health and safety issues, career prospects. So uh, quite broad, and uh, we tried to understand a lot about what's going on. We initially received over 3,600 surveys from 55 different countries, and there were 55 different nationalities involved. Here you see where we went. The surveys, I will point out, were hand-delivered by representatives from FIFPRO and our affiliated player unions around the world. The countries here you see now in a darker shade are the ones that made the cut. 33 countries, a total of 3,295 questionnaires that were processed by Aristea and her team. This includes some of the world's most developed leagues in England, France, Germany, Sweden and the United States. Now if a country delivered less than 25 surveys, they were eliminated for scientific reasons because uh, this could have made the country-by-country -country comparisons misleading. A sensitive topic. The definition of a professional footballer. This is what you currently see in the FIFA regulations. A professional is a player who has a written contract with a club, a club, and is paid more for his, you'll see the the language is very masculine, for his footballing activity than the expenses he effectively incurs. Uh, all other players are considered to be amateurs. If we go by FIFA's definition, we find 18%, 18% 18 of our respondents, when we cross-tabulate written contracts with adequacy of payment, have both a written contract and earn enough to cover their expenses. But I'd also like to point out that we found that 58% of the 3,300 players we surveyed earn some form of income. In other words, a club or a national federation, because sometimes 
the employer body might be considered the national federation paying players to represent the country, like in the United States, like in Australia, centralized contracts through the federations, are paying players, female players, to perform services related to football, 58%. So 18% meet the definition, but 58% are earning income from the game. A key finding, a rather striking statistic, if we look at the way men's football has been run traditionally, the clubs are providing the contracts and paying the salaries. Well, here we find 50% of the female players surveyed are receiving no pay from their clubs. These are women mostly under the age of 23. Over a third of national team players said they do not receive a single penny to play for their country. More on that in a moment. If we keep the focus on club payments just here, this will give you an idea of the sums we found. Over 60% take home, this is net, between one and 600 US dollars a month. Okay, that's after tax. 30% earn between 600 and 2,000 a month, and 0.8% are in that upper bracket receiving 4,000 US dollars a month or more. Okay, they're the sums that help contextualize because we saw that half of the players are receiving nothing from clubs and when they are receiving we see these amounts and we also measure the adequacy of payment whether these amounts are enough for them to cover their expenses. Is it enough to cover their expenses? This is a regional breakdown. Okay, 36% told us they get paid, remember? We're talking about who wasn't paid and who gets paid. Well, 36% tell us they get paid, but it's not enough to cover their expenses. And 3% actually told us they, they have to pay to play. It's not reflected in this graph, but this is an idea of what we've done regionally, and we've got country by country breakdowns on the various charts as well. This regional example gives you the breakdown of players that are paid or not. Those not paid are represented in light blue. The green bar in the middle shows the percentage of players who told us the money they receive uh, uh, is adequate or not. So we, we are trying to give you a picture of where exactly the situation is for the development of the game. And we know there's a long way to go, but for the first time we've been able to quantify it. Now, we interviewed many players uh, around the world randomly, anonymously. Uh, two of us told us uh, these and made these observations that if clubs are going to use players every day, they need to pay them like professionals. So what is the definition of a professional? You know, full time, how many hours do you train and so on. But it's a very different landscape that we've had to adapt to, to try and understand where progress can be made to impl implement certain minimum standards. You see the second player talking about we're never going to have equality with men. Some may disagree. I would like to disagree in many ways. However, there should be a minimum salary, minimum contractual standards. What exists for women, what exists for men. We have some experience in that area and we could share it with you at another time if you'd like to know what's been done for the men in this area. Interesting to see if players are paid on time. Uh, we've compared men and women here. 37% of female players have experienced delays. It drops to 33% for players who possess a written contract, and it rises to 49% for those who don't. Now, FIFPRO also surveyed around just under 14,000 male professionals last year, with, again, the help of Manchester University, and we found 41% experienced overdue pay in the last two seasons. So, some sim similarities mm -hmm. there, Aris, there. Yeah. Certainly, on non-payment. Yeah, there were definitely similarities. I think the only difference was in respect of the length of the payment delays. In the sense that in the case of women, I think that we found lower percentages of women uh, experiencing longer payment delays. Mm. So lasting you know, like even more than a year. So the percentage of those players was higher in the case of men. Yes, and uh, that's bringing us to the next point because you can see that 9% of women reported delays of three months of more. We've uh, reached that figure by adding up the three columns on the right. And this is in the last two seasons, 28% indicated delays of up to three months. I will just point out that the reason we look at this is first of all, twofold, human rights. Every worker should be entitled to be paid on time and in full every month is a fundamental principle of FIFPRO. 
The FIFA regulations in the men's game allows some flexibility there, that clubs can even be defaulting 90 days on payments to men before any kind of rights for the player to terminate their contract comes into effect. Okay, to terminate your contract with just cause, as you say, the cause that the club is not honouring the payment. So we also like to look at how long these, these delays occur, because in football we find that there are some patterns. Up to three months is where we look, that's green and light blue, and beyond even, in some countries, a year. Not just for women, for men as well. And we have surveys in both areas. If you'd like to learn more, I can certainly make uh, the, the men's survey available to you another time. Uh, we're going to spend uh, the next few minutes focusing on the conditions of national team players because the survey of 40 questions also had a component dedicated to national team players. Allow me to start the section with a direct quote from the report that states, women need national teams to support them fully because the club won't. Very different if we have this level discussion about football for the women because for the men, you talk about it being inverted the other way around. And 45% of the players reported having some experience with their national teams. They represented their country. And that's a large sample. So we're talking about a very elite group of players here, and it's very striking and alarming to see some of the figures that have been uh, returned to us. We know that in women's football, national federations are sometimes acting as employer bodies. Less than 1 in 10 or 9%, I could say that the 9% of the players surveyed had a written contract in place with their national teams, we found. And there was also a great deal of confusion about the contracts because 79% of the players were not even aware what kind of contract existed between them and their national federations. And in fact, of that very small percentage of players who did have a contract, 80% of the players told us that they didn't even have a copy of the contract. Yes, I see your mouth is wide open, <laughs> but it's true. Yeah, it is extraordinary. Yeah, because of course, you know, like a, a copy of the contract is quite important because of course, you know, like it provides information on the terms and conditions of employment. So it's a very useful tool, of course, for enforcing also labor rights. Yeah, useful to say the yeah. least. Yes. In case yeah. of a it's the basis. dispute <laughs> as well. Now, now here we come back to a theme I, I raised earlier. 35% of national team players are not paid to represent their countries. Uh, many people have approached me saying, but it's an honor to represent your country, you should not be paid at all. I'll leave that to you to decide. 42% said the money they receive is not enough, however, to cover expenses. You even see a tiny fraction are paying to play for their national team. I know Stephanie Roach is here with us. They just achieved a breakthrough in negotiations with their national federation to establish certain conditions, match fees, uh, bonuses, and so on, per diems, reimbursements for taking time off work. That was not even existent. And one of the players on that national team told me directly, it's an honor to play for your country, yes, but you shouldn't be out of pocket to do so. Leaving their jobs to represent their countries and not being reimbursed in any way, shape, or form. Is that correct? We think not. The level of prize money on offer. We're going to just touch on that. That's an issue for players. 66% are unhappy with it. Hope Solo, the well-known American goalkeeper, attended a conference held by FIFPRO in Amsterdam on August 8th, and she actually told us that she was surprised that 100% of the players were not unhappy with the level of prize money. <laughs> she was very entertaining. And another 24%, if you look at this, are moderately satisfied with the prize money. The 66% is generated by the two columns on the left. The central column is the other 24% I just mentioned. So we find ourselves here at a very important juncture because players have told FIFPRO, and we are employed by the players, our policies are developed because of what the players believe to be fundamental, to prioritize. We find ourselves at this juncture of how do we address this issue? How do we address this issue and, and what should be the next steps to bridge the gap of prize money being insufficient? For the sake of comparing prize money for men and women at the most recent major tournaments, that's what we asked them about, FIFA and UEFA I've identified here because we just had Euro 2017 for women, compared that with the equivalent for men the year before and the two FIFA World Cups for men and women. You see the differences here, I won't go into the details uh, because all those tournaments have a different number of teams participating in them. 
However, I will say, this is a very important note, that for us, this is money that is going to the national federations as prize money, okay, based on performance, qualification, how far a team advances. Players may receive a very small percentage based on the negotiations they conduct in their respective countries, but there's no guarantee they'll receive the money. The money goes to the national federation, and in good faith, that money is meant to be passed on to the players, who we hope have negotiated a percentage, a fair share of the commercial revenue based on collective bargaining agreements in their countries. I do know about a number of countries and what conditions they have and what they've agreed with their national federations, but as you can appreciate, I'm not at liberty to share those details of the percentages involved. However, I, I can tell you one that is for the public record. For example, in Australia, they've managed to secure 30% of revenue for the players, men and women, equal share relative to the money generated from those tournaments. If we move on here to the payment delays, I just wanted to point out quickly that national team payment delays, we also found here an issue. 38.5% of players experience problems in receiving their money on time from their national FAs. National team players were also asked if they've experienced the clash between their club and national team commitments that fell on dates outside the FIFA international match calendar. This is a problem for a lot of players who have to compromise. It affects their clubs and the ability to represent their countries. 16% said they have experienced a clash or 14% know of a teammate who has had a clash. And it raises the specter of how we can better align the international match calendar. It'll be uh, great to hear your thoughts, Tatiana, having worked on that uh, yourself a little uh, uh, in terms of how the women can be better aligned between club and country. If we move on to health and safety, there are some different questions we had to apply to the female player survey compared to the men. This is one of them, and there are different issues that have come up in recent times topically uh, that we've also wanted to cover. For example, we found 62% of players said that they have never been asked about their menstrual cycle, either by the coaching or team medical staff. Now, the reason we raise this is obvious, in that we want to raise awareness from FIFPRO side of you about the issues involved affecting performance, yes, but also this is a health and safety uh, issue. We want to guard against potential risks and to improve and contextualize the conditions for the players. This is the kind of study we've undertaken to show this must be a prerequisite. We must understand how women need to be accommodated in a certain way in order to be at their optimal and also to be protected in terms of health and safety. We looked at abuse and discrimination in the workplace, including sexual harassment. We didn't ask this of the men at the time. It's something we can revisit because we'll be doing these uh, surveys over and over again uh, in the coming years. 3.5%, okay, I want to say that again, 3.5% globally are affected here, uh, have been victims of sexual harassment. That's around 115 players of the total survey. What you see here is a breakdown of that 3.5%, okay? So let's not confuse that with uh, anything that could be seen to be any more than what it is right now, but we're not wanting to diminish the, the, what the victims went through. But if you look at the table here, most of the victims described coaching staff as the perpetrators. That is the column on the far right, okay? That was the, the biggest return, followed by uh, experiencing sexual harassment by fans on non-match days. So you see we've, we've looked at a various number of issues. This full report will be made later in the year, but this is to give you an overview of where we went. Also, we dedicated a question to homophobia. Okay, yes, on homophobia. 5.4% globally experienced this form of discrimination. Okay, uh, so that's one area that we wanted to touch on as well as match fixing, we did it with the men. It was an anonymous survey for women, we found 5% reported being approached for match fixing uh, compared to 6.7% from the men a year ago. And there were certain corresponding hotspots we found where players are being approached to fix matches. You see, these are the women, Namibia, Venezuela, Botswana, Slovenia. And I'll skip over Greece, not for you, I just there, but to Cameroon, because they are the corresponding hotspots to the men's survey. So we see a correlation between the two. You wanted just to raise a point, I just there, about 
uh, the, the, these questions in particular? Yeah, I, I want to be brief. Uh, I think that like, in terms of those questions on homophobia, uh, sexual harassment and also match fixing, there is a problem generally in research and data collection about under-reporting. So it is presumed, I mean, it has actually, you know, like, uh, been proven that players are actually reluctant you know, like to come forward and report those problems. So I think that it's important to remember that when we discuss you know, like the rates on those issues. Okay, and uh, just to finish up, this is a key finding that uh, we would like to be the basis of our next discussion. How do we plug this gap? Because we found that 87% of the players indicated they would consider quitting the game early. And in fact, we've tried to give it a little more context, quitting before their prime, we say. And what are the reasons? Reason number one was leaving to start a family, childcare support, maternity leave, so the lack of support to combine motherhood with a football career. Second was leaving because of financial reasons. Third, leaving to pursue career opportunities. Okay, I also just want to quickly say that the women who come into professional football, we found, are three times more likely to earn a university degree than the men. And so therefore, that's a positive thing in that the educational basis to transition to life after, but they're doing it out of necessity, not because the game is giving them the opportunity to dedicate more time to football. They're spending more time on, some might argue, an even more uh, a better pursuit in some ways. But we have to support them to be footballers. Because if we're women are quitting early, we try to show what is the playing population look like? Our population that we surveyed is the dark line. Under the age of 23, you see a very large number of players. And then it drops down, 24 to 28 and beyond. The men is the light shade behind it, and there's a more gradual decline from the ages of 18 to 23 throughout the period, of course, because they're staying in the game longer. And, uh, and, and we wanted to define, are they quitting before their prime? Because experience, we found, was a winning characteristics, certainly in terms of the Olympic Games of 2016 and the World Cup in Canada for uh, the USA and Germany respectively, as well as the other two who reached the final. That experience was a key factor. The average ages are reflected there. So players are quitting far too early. We know that. I'd like to thank you for your uh, attention and hand back to Tatiana. Okay, thank you very much. Very interesting. I'm happy to ask now the players on stage. One is Gabby George from Everton and one is Stephanie Roch from Sunderland. Please join us. So, I would of course immediately like to start with uh, the two of you to ask you, you've seen now with this presentation and all these uh, statistics, how is it for you in your life being a professional football player? How did you become a professional football player and how do you live your dream? Um, with me being young, I've only just gone professional for the past two, three months now. Um, so I haven't really got to see this side of it. I've only just stepped into it, but I was previously part-time and I had to juggle a job and trying to train as much as the full-time girls did. Um, obviously going professional for me is a big step in the right direction and hopefully the women's game can continue to get bigger and we can be professional and stable at the same time. So it's a good start, but uh, obviously it has to improve. Yeah, um, it's a good starting point for us. Um, when you're younger, financial isn't really the biggest part of it for us. That's more us enjoying it and trying to get as high as we can in the game but um, obviously when you get older it's enjoying the game and trying to have a stable lifestyle. And Steph you have a, a bit more experience, you have yeah. played in a couple of countries and clubs, can you tell us about your history so far? Yeah I think obviously as Gabby said I think when you're starting off it's all about the love of the game and wanting to play football and just enjoy the game overall but the older you get in your career and the more you go and play and experience different things in different countries I suppose you learn that maybe it's not in some places, all is cracked up to be. I think I've experienced the good and bad of women's football. I think the survey has kind of opened people's, a lot of people's eyes to what goes on in women's football. And I think for me, I think um, at my stage of career now, it's definitely coming to a stage where I'm thinking career-wise, what should I be doing? Financial-wise, what should I be doing? Family-wise, I mean, I want to have kids, I want to have a family. And it's, it's probably that stage of my career now where it's kind of coming to this crucial part of things where I do have to consider different options and, and unfortunately I will have to maybe think about pulling away from football if, if that's what I want to do. So it's, I suppose, 
the, the older you get and the more, I suppose, um, things you have on your life and things that are changing in your life, there's more you have to consider the difference between loving the football that you're playing and maybe taking different opportunities that come your way. How much did you think about this when you were younger, when you were starting to play football and you were maybe 18, 19, 20, 22? How much did you think about your education, a potential of having a family, and how do you need to juggle your life? To be honest with you, and it's probably not the most intelligent answer, but I didn't really think about it. I think, as I said, I just love football. I wanted to play football. It was all I ever thought about. And I thought I was going to become a superstar and earn loads of money, but the reality of it is, is that it's, it's just not there for women at the minute. I think, from my point of view, it's definitely got a lot better over the years. Since I started off playing football, there was probably, in Ireland anyway, not a lot of girls' teams and clubs. I think now, in Ireland, every club has girls' clubs the whole way up in age groups. So it definitely is getting better, but I think there's still a lot more to be done. And hopefully over the next few years, as I said, it will improve even more. And is there any support from your national association or from your club uh, in regards to your education or your post-football career? I think for most players involved in England, obviously the PFA do help out with stuff like that. And I think for players going into new clubs, it's, it's probably more about knowing who to ask about it because I think in clubs at times, they don't probably come to you with, this is what we can offer you, you can do this and you can do that. I think it's more players as individuals going to the club and saying, look, I'd be interested in getting some more of uh, educational stuff in, in the background and, and asking people at the club. So I think it's basically knowing who to ask about it and, and maybe having clubs put it out there a little bit more for players to know about it. And for you, Gabby, do you think about your already your career after your football career or you're focusing only on football right now? Um, when I was in school and college, I did concentrate on getting my my grades that I needed for when I left but then when I finished college then I started to concentrate more on football to get to where I wanted to be and then hopefully in the next couple of years I'm going to look back into education and see what pathways I can take and what journey I want to go into after football. And we have seen some of the challenges in that presentation and we also heard in the past some of the success stories from national associations who went on strike with their national federation. Uh, we know in, uh, in the US there was a case with US national team players. In Australia we had a, a case and Andrew mentioned, uh, Steph, your country as well. <laughs> have you heard about um, this, these cases and have you any thought about it? Have you thought about yourself, about something you don't like and you would like to improve? Um, I heard about when it happened in Ireland, um, I did hear about that, but I haven't really took much interest into it. Um, I think England do support the women's football a lot, like in, we have central contracts, obviously I don't have one personally, but when you make a step up to the senior team they have central contracts which kind of help you with your finances and obviously what you miss out when you do go on camps, um, and then I think the England, England and the FA do it well for us, so I've never really experienced anything different. So you're lucky. <laughs> and Steph, for you, you were part of that team and you went through it and all the media and, and the activities. How much can you tell us about that time? Uh, maybe why did it start and what, what happened and what do you think now looking back? Yeah, I think obviously no player as a footballer wants to go and strike or miss a game or miss a competition. It's never anything that you want to do or even think that you would have to do going into international duty. But it's something for us as players that was going on in the background for a long time. We, we never wanted it to become public. It was just kind of, to be fair, we were being pushed back a lot. It was We were told, oh, yeah, it's going to come, it's going to come. And it just never did. And the more we were thinking about it was... and. In fairness to some of the players who have retired recently, I think they knew that if it wasn't done now, it would never be done because, as Gabby says, I think most of the players that are coming up in our Irish team are young and they don't understand what's going to come in later life and when they get to a stage in their career when they have to think about financial stuff, they have to think about mortgages, they have to think about work and they, ha you know, they have to juggle all these things. So I think for us as senior players within that squad, we realised that the time to do it was when we done it. And as I said, we're just happy with the response that it did get from the media because if we're honest with ourselves going into it, we weren't sure what reaction it would get. And as Andrew said, like some people would say, well, you're playing for your country, you, should, you don't deserve to be paid. But at the end of the day, I think the main thing is that you shouldn't have to go out of pocket to pay for your country either. And that was, I suppose, the main point we wanted to make. 
and also another question regarding to uh, contracts. You know, there's uh, the question, when are you a professional player and what does it mean? And um, what kind of a contract do you have with your club, with your national association? Maybe also regarding your future, your post-career uh, education. How much do you know about it and how much maybe you would think support is needed or more guidance is needed? Do you think um, it's worthwhile talking about more legal issues and more consultancy for players? Um, I think personally like at Everton we get a lot of help when it comes to contracts like and you can go and get further help from agents if you did need it. Um, I'm lucky enough to have like a family that know a lot about football and a lot about contracts and stuff so I got help on that basis but I think having a club there that can help and you know that they're doing what's right for you and not just what's right for the club is beneficial. Yeah, I think as well, I think a lot of people would be surprised that the amount of women or female footballers that actually don't have agents or have people that can help them out with that. So that will be definitely something that I think would benefit players just to know what they should be asking for or what maybe they're entitled to within their contract. So I think having help with that would definitely help girls the more they get into their career and the further they progress. And before we open uh, for, to the floor for some questions, um, question for both of you, if you have three wishes for your future football career, or even for maybe even younger ones, you're still young, but for the ones coming after you, what would it be? Um, I think more media coverage. Um, obviously, we have a couple of games that are going to be on TV for the WSL season, but I think every men's game is on TV, so why shouldn't women's be? Um, I think just more equality in terms of men and women being seen as the same sport, not just women's football and men's football, and just the stability in the game. I'm um, pretty much going to be saying pretty much the same as Gabby has said. I think in terms of equality, I think a lot of female footballers are realistic in knowing that women's football isn't at the stage the men's game is in terms of media attraction and I suppose commercial attraction, but if maybe one day we can kind of get there, it would be obviously a great thing for women's football and helping to promote the game and progress the game at grassroots and at professional levels and um, I think also for younger players coming up I think I'd like for them to be able to have stability and be able to to not have to worry about the certain things that, that senior level players now are having to think about in terms of financial worries and having to start the family etc and think if younger players can have that stability when they get a little bit older I think that would be something that I'd like to see. Good. Okay, would like to give uh, everybody a chance for some questions if there are some. If not, we will continue with uh, the two players, yeah? I just wondered, we saw the, the stats from Andrew Aristea about... Hi, we saw, we saw the stats about players retiring early. I was wondering if the, the two panellists have any... Because they're just numbers when we see them on the, the screen. Have you seen that in your career, teammates that have had to stop because they couldn't balance the, the playing demands and, and work and, and life? Yeah, I... Sorry, cutting across here. But yeah, I definitely have. Um, actually, quite recently, one of our players within the Irish team. Unfortunately, everything that we got from everything that happened recently it came a little bit too late for her. She had focused on her work a lot, and at times the Irish trips, and she was actually playing at home, a home-based player, an amateur player. But the international trips were interfering with her work. And in fairness, she took the opportunities she was getting at a very high-tech company to be able to go and live and work in Australia. So that was something that that she took on board and it wasn't as if she was a kind of a fringe player as well. She, two or three years ago, won the player of the year. So she was a very big player for our team and unfortunately she was one that kind of slipped through the net, I think. So I've definitely seen it happening and there's other players within our Irish team at the minute who have very good careers as well. So I can, I can see it happening again in the future if it's not sorted out a little bit quicker than, as I said, it was before. Uh, yeah, I've seen it too just recently. Um, a lot of a lot of people in the women's game are teachers, so when a lot of teams are now turning full-time, you can't balance teaching and playing football at the same time. So obviously teaching, and you have a stability in your career and you know where it's heading, so a lot of people have chosen that path because you know where it's going to go. Yeah, I mean, I'm the president of FC Zurich women's team and one of our players was uh, part of the Swiss national team. And in a year when Switzerland qualified for the FIFA Women's World Cup in Canada, 2015, she had uh, to take three months unpaid leave. So of the 12th month, she had three months just to travel to the games and do all the training sessions and the camps. And, um, and of course, her holidays were in that included. So no holidays and 
and three months is a lot. Hi, um, my name is Rita. I'm a sports architect. Um, and I would like to ask you if in the survey any questions were asked regarding the infrastructures where um, women train. Because um, through my career I've talked to um, a lot of players, um, men and women, and I know they don't have the same conditions to train. The, um, and the facilities, the elite facilities, are designed for men. Um, I'm trying to make architecture a bit more inclusive, stadiums, training centers, but uh, I would like to support this with the real concerns of the female players. Um, was there any research done on that? Uh, no is the short answer. Uh, the, <coughs> the survey started, and we have it here, I can show you the exact questioning, and we can also share it to you all digitally if you would like to get more of an overview before the full text is out. However, we started with 120 questions. Uh, if you know how these things go, 120 questions to players uh, before a training session or before a match, uh, when you've got 10 to 15 minutes with them, it doesn't fly. Uh, so we had to boil it down and the prioritization was put into many of the areas you saw here. So that can also be included in future development. We have no data on that at the moment. But there, there are some ideas about the conditions, of course, that players experience and indeed whether they're sufficient, but nothing that I don't think could uh, assist you right now in that regard. Okay, the time is over, so thank you very much. Andrew Aristea for your fantastic work and very interesting figures. Uh, they're really helpful for the future of women's football to have a basis uh, and to show the world where are the issues. And the two players, thanks very much for joining us and being here and good luck for your future.